thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I'm Rachel Force, currently working at the University of Brighton. Um, I've been a podiatrist for about 21 years now um, and for the last 17 years of that I've been um, specialising and working in diabetic foot ulceration and wound care. Um, so I've got quite a bit of experience at treating patients on a regular weekly basis and their requirements whilst they have these very difficult hard to heal wounds. So what is an ulcer? Um, basically it's a lesion of the skin or mucous membranes um, marked by inflammation, tissue damage and necrosis and slough. Typically it can take a very long time to heal. Um, some of the definitions are that they've failed to heal in an orderly manner. Um, so there's arguments out there as to when does a wound become an acute wound become a chronic ulcer. So the different articles quote different time periods. Um, what we do know is that they're um, very tro pro problematic for the patient. Um, there are quotes out there saying that one to two percent of the population will suffer a chronic wound in their lifetime. Um, some reports report that some chronic wounds are unhealed at three months, some are six months, um, some venous leg ulcers are unhealed after a year, certainly some diabetic foot wounds are unhealed after a year. Um, I know I've treated patients for 72 weeks or more with very severe wood foot ulceration. Um, some leg ulceration is sort of average duration is six to 12 weeks. <coughs> Um, the majority receive their treatment in community settings like the Leaf Hospital or GP practice nurse centres, um, leg clinics. Um, however, 21% end up being treated in hospital settings um, and the costs there multiply um, significantly. So some sorts of chronic wounds that we treat um, and it's very difficult to estimate how many chronic wounds there are out there because ulcers tend to get clumped in two categories. So we have diabetic foot wounds, there's venous leg ulceration, um, pressure sores, surgical site infections you can get statistics on, there's burns, not included here are arterial leg wounds, rheumatoid arthritis associated ulceration um, and mixed etiology leg ulceration. So they're the ones with venous and arterial components. So when you start considering the actual burden of these wounds, um, it is very difficult to quantify and it is huge. Um, so when we deal with patients with chronic, to chronic wounds, um, it does have a massive impact on their quality of life and their social activities. Um, I've had some patients that don't want to leave the house because they're um, embarrassed about the odour of a leg ulceration. They don't, they don't want to, so they lose that motivation. Um, it becomes very difficult for them to um, keep their self-esteem and then depression usually ensues. Um, they, complain, they complain about pain. Uh, where's my pointer? Um, pain, the exudate levels, if they've got um, very leaky legs or foot wounds, it's very difficult to get clothes that will cover those um, and the odours that will ensue, they don't want to leave the house and become more socially isolated. Um, they can lose mobility because they find it difficult to get footwear on over the bandages, they can't get, sh um, they can't get trousers to fit with the leg swelling and the leg edema. Um, and then they find it very difficult to maintain that personal hygiene. Um, it's quite easy for us to leap in the shower or have a quick bath, but if you've got leg wounds or foot wounds and you're being advised to keep those dry, it becomes very difficult to just do your own personal routines that I know I'd be certainly upset about if I couldn't leap in the shower. Um, not to have, not um, also to add into the mix that if these wounds aren't appropriately managed or become too serious um, or too severe infection wise, it can lead to a loss of limb and it can increase the risk of loss of life depending on the severity of infection. So these are huge impacts on not only the patient but on the carers and the relatives of the patient. They're very difficult to deal with. Um, so 
Considering not only the patients, there is the impact that um, Ian mentioned. There's practitioner time, um, which varies depending on and community settings. There's the cost of dressings, antibiotic medication costs. Um, with increased infection, there's increased inpatient care. So you're looking um, at increased cost of patients staying in hospitals. I think it, um, some diabetic foot ulceration, you increase the likelihood of bed days with an infection to about 22 extra inpatient days. And when you cost those extra 22 patient days for every single person with a leg or foot wound, you can see how the costs soon mount up. Um, and then once they've been discharged, you've got increased outpatient care, post-surgical care, and then the costs of surgical invention if sometimes surgery is required to increase blood flow to the leg or to remove a part of the foot or leg that has been too seriously damaged. So we therefore need to surgically intervene in order to get the wound to closure. So they are a significant problem, these non-healing wounds, and typically account for 2 to 4% of healthcare budgets. Um, what I tried to do is pull quite a few articles together to sort of try and, and give you an idea of some of the, the costs involved. So the little asterisk denotes that they're all associated with a high infection risk because these are chronic long-standing wounds. Um, diabetic foot ulceration, we're looking at a prevalence of about 5 to 7 percent. I've also tried to put European sort of figures in here as well. Um, so the average cost per patient with a diabetic foot wound is between 7.7 .7 and 25,000 euros per foot wound. Um, then we're looking at annual NHS cost of between sort of 640 million to 660 million, but the average EU cost is between four and six billion euros. So then we look at pressure ulceration, which is um, one in five inpatients in the UK in the UK in 2000 in the UK um, and we're looking at average NHS cost of um, between 1.8 and 2.6 billion. Venous leg ulceration we're looking at six and a half billion EU cost. So by the time and this is only four four categories yeah when we add in those arterial ulceration and um, the complications of these surgical site infections the costs escalate. Okay, so future trends. Um, this burden is, like, is going to increase um, over the next 20 years. The population forecast is due to increase from 60.4 million to 63.8 million by 2025. Um, and the population over 65 is due to increase to 22%. However, the population under 65 is only expected to increase by 1%. So there's less of a younger generation to help cover um, the, you know, the ageing population. And ulceration prevalence increases as the population gets older. So we're more susceptible to these. Um, so the predicted increase in type 2 diabetes is we are expecting an extra 25,000 foot ulceration cases per year as the increase of diabetes, type 2 diabetes increases. So it's going to have a significant impact. So just a little bit on diabetes is there's 415 million adults living with diabetes in the world. Um, there's 59.8 million in the EU region. Um, and there's four and a half million people with diabetes in the UK. Um, Diabetes, type 2 diabetes is increasing in children, so there are more people being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes earlier. Um, and as we said, that point prevalence is about 5 to 7% of people with diabetes will end up with a foot wound. And it's the most common associated um, cause of lower leg amputation known. Diabetes UK um, state that 80% of these are avoidable if appropriate treatment is started early enough. So these are a lot of legs. So we're talking 20 amputations a day per toes, midfoot or limb. So these are scary figures that the, the better we can treat these wounds, we can try and reduce these figures. 
Um, venous leg ulceration is the most common type of leg ulceration. It affects 1% of the population. Um, it's 3% over the age of 80. So as we become older, we're, we're going to see more of these. 93% heal in 12 months. 7% remain unhealed at five years. So it's this impact of these people that have these chronic wounds for five years and you're seeing them weekly, you become a part of their social interaction and you get to know these people very well. Um, pressure ulceration is becoming really hot on the agenda because it does affect um, a large proportion of inpatients. Um, very high risk of deep infection because it's very easy to get through. There's not much skin on the back of a heel to get to the heel bone. Likewise on sacral pressure sores. Where you get them, they're typically over bony prominences. So it can be, they're very susceptible to infections and deep infections, which will require surgical debridement or IV antibiotics to help sort those out. Um, um, it's reported that one in five inpatients develops a pressure ulcer or, can, or ends up with a pressure ulceration and their average stay is 13.8 days but it can vary so you can see the range 1 to 134 days of being in hospital. Um, but we need to develop new methods to help treat these people. Um, so when a wound heals they all, if it's acute or chronic, they all follow the same progression. So you have the initial injury and damage, which then triggers this coagulation and in inflammation phase. So some books will say it's four phases and the coagulation is one. Then it's the inflammatory phase. Then we go on to the proliferative phase. So we've, we've got a hole in the skin. Your cells need to proliferate, grow and divide, fill the hole as fast as we can to get skin closure. And then once we've got skin closure, we're then going to take our time and we're going to mature and regenerate and restructure that hastily infilled um, cell growth to try and get um, better tensile strength across that area. So, the inflammatory phase or exudative phase is, is there as, as part of, it's essential for keeping the wound bed clean, um, for allowing growth factors to move across the, the wound bed. Um, it helps to get rid of slough and devitalised tissue. It's got proteases in there that help dissolve. Um, it helps white blood cells move and get rid of contaminants and bacteria that are in there. Um, so we need a good inflammatory response when we injure ourselves. We then move on to proliferation, which is nice healthy granulation tissue, and then we go on to maturation and scar formation. Um, I've got some pictures now, I hope people aren't too squeamish. Um, so what we're looking for in a nice healthy wound is really nice red healthy granulation tissue. So this is signs that we've got new arterial capillary bed loops at the bottom of the wound it's not looking mucky you know there's no slough there there's there, there might be you know bacterial contamination in there but the host defenses are keeping it at bay allowing it to heal and then you can see this nice pink skin around the edge here this is new epithelial skin which will eventually migrate over the wound surface and you might see little islands popping up um, through the 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 wound bed and that's what we love to see and eventually you'll get this scar formation nice epithelialized skin back to normal Yay. Um, so we need to see these stages what we don't want are those sort of sluffy lots of pus um, mucky looking wound beds because that tells you they're stuck there's a problem so just as a little pictorial format so we've got a little sort of gouge out of our skin, might be our arm or foot, wherever. Um, typically the wounds that we tend to see, they will be contaminated because it will be done by shoes being too small and they've rubbed a big blister and that the lids come off and then we've got sock fluff and goodness knows what in there. Um, so you will have some microbes of some description. So we've got these microbes entering the wound and as part of the inflammatory process, you get vasodilation. That allows white blood cells to migrate from the blood vessels and travel to the site of injury. And that allows the neutrophils to engulf and phagocytose um, and get rid of some of these individual bacteria. 
Um, what they also then do is signal um, cytok they cytokine release. So you get cytokines released from the damaged tissues, you get them released from the macrophages, sending out messages to say, we've got skin damage here, we've got invading pathogens, we need to repair this area as fast as we can, so send in the cavalry. Yeah? So basically what we end up with is more neutrophils and more macrophages come in to help clean the wound bed. They help secrete um, growth factors um, to <coughs> stimulate new vessel growth and get new capillary bed loops and that lovely red granulation tissue in the wound bed. We get growth factors derived from the platelets, which also help kickstart this wound healing cell proliferation phase. Um, and then it also stimulates fibroblasts to move into the area and lay down new collagen networks build the structure back into this hole and then we get more sort of epidermal cell growth over the top and we get the hole filled in. Now, the, we basically want that to happen as fast as possible whilst keeping it as clean as possible. And usually your body's first line defense are those white blood cells followed by the lymphocytes after about three days. Um, so if it's working well, you get that really good red healthy tissue, but sometimes in chronic wound, there's lots of factors that make it go slightly awry. It's, um, so as part of the exudate, um, there's substances called matrix metalloproteases. So proteases are structures that are normal and essential in wound healing in normal quantities, but if they become too excessive, they cause all sorts of problems. So we need them in the inflammatory phase for getting rid of any broken damaged cells, any damaged tissues, to get rid of them to allow the remaining whole cells to multiply, proliferate, grow and divide and fill in the hole. Um, if we didn't have the proteases, you need to loosen the attachments of the cells next door because cells need to be able to move about a bit. So you've got to release some of the tethers of where they're anchored to the cells next door. So you need these proteases to actually allow normal wound healing to happen. And as we get scar formation and we've got closure, um, you've noticed when you cut yourself that scars over time shrink and contract and sort of reduce and they go from pink to white and that's this part of these metalloproteases because as the wound edges contract and the remodeling phase occurs if you didn't have those proteases you would have extra tissue still left and the skin wouldn't be able to contract and shrink so you have to get rid of some of the extra cells and you've got to get rid of the extra capillary loops that have been formed over time in that acute healing response. So they are vital, but they tend to go a bit awry in chronic wounds. So typically we tend to see in chronic wounds, they take a lot longer to heal up than an acute wound. And again, it's that quote of a timely manner, but it, that varies from wound to wound. Um, so these are some factors that are associated with wound, delayed wound healing. So as we get older, our tissue quality isn't as good, so it takes us longer. We have senescent cells, so they don't seem to migrate or divide as well as they should. Um, we get the epithelial cells don't seem to migrate over the wound surface. Um, it's typically a very inflammatory environment, so it's stuck in that inflammation phase. So it produces a lot of exudate. We get more of those proteases, which cause more tissue damage to healthy tissue and keeps that inflammatory phase going. Um, because we've got all those proteases, we can, they, they, those proteases can denature or damage the growth factors that are produced in the wound bed. So basically you end up with the exudate that's supposed to be helping in a chronic environment starts damaging the, 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 the messengers that are actually telling cells that you need to grow and divide and fill this hole. And for every protease, there's an inhibitor of protease. And what you notice in chronic wound or studies have shown is that there are reduced inhibitors of these proteases. So these are all areas that potentially, if we could identify a wound that has got low growth factors or it's got low inhibitors of proteases, it might give the clinician a bit of a clue as to what can we do? What can we do here? 
Um, so there's lots of other things. So infection and biofilms has a massive implication on chronic wounds. Um, and then as we get sort of damaged wound beds, what you tend to find is um, the quality of the, the replaced tissue isn't as good, so it's more susceptible to later injury. Even if you do get healing, it's more susceptible to reulceration. So we've got to watch them even careful, more carefully after they heal. So this is a sort of a typical sort of leg ulceration that you might see. It's a bit, it's a chronic wound and there's lots going on. So what you tend to find is, you know, most people tend to say, oh, it'd be good if a wound just went through an ordered sequence of events but what you'll tend to find is there's different patches of the wound at different different places all at the same time so what we've actually got going on is we've got sorry for the quality of the picture but we've got red granulation tissue up here which is lovely and that's what we want to see and then we've got little islands of epithelial skin popping up which again is lovely that we want to see However, there's little dark patches down here and sloughy yellow patches, which tells us that there's a bit of infection and colonisation starting down here. So the top of the wound is behaving how we want it to, but the bottom of the wound isn't. So we've got a mixed etiology in there. So we've got different parts of the wound bed at different stages of the healing continuum all at the same time on a patient. So trying to pick a dress in, that can cope with that and keep it going in the right direction, well, keep this bit going in the right direction and pull this bit round and back into the healing process is very difficult. Yeah? So, um, so we've, we have an issue with these proteases. Um, I've said they inhibit those protease inhibitors. There's less of them. Um, so we get more inflammatory cytokines, which keep exudate levels high. Growth factors get reduced because of that. Cell numbers decrease, so we don't get that proliferation. So it slows down the whole cell senescence thing. And then that gives the opportunity for microbial um, bacteria, uh, an ideal substrate that they can feed on and then increases the chances of a, of a, a colonized wound becoming a chronic, critically contaminated wound, which will drive over into um, infection, spreading infection. So as a clinician, decent wound care relies on a really thorough, really effective assessment. Um, if we do a superficial assessment, you're not going to look at all the factors that are required in order to keep a wound going towards that healing trajectory. We need to cover as many of the factors that might be delaying the wound healing and try and address as many of those as we possibly can. And that's the best way that we can manage wounds. Um, this is quite a nice um, <coughs> spreadsheet. I don't know if you'll be able to read it from the back, but um, it's a nice pictorial about from Vauden et al um, as part of the European Wound Management Association to give you a clue as to the factors that cause problems with wound healing. So we've got factors related to the patient. So what's, what's caused the wound in the first place? Have they got any allergies? What medication are they on? Are they in any pain? Are they likely to be concordant with what we need to do in order to heal this wound? Have they got diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis? Have they got any medication that suppresses their immune system? So we've got to take all those factors into account. Then we're looking at the wound. Where is it? How deep is it? Because the deeper a wound is, the more likely it's going to take longer and the greater chance of infection you've got. Um, what's the wound bed condition? Is it pink and healthy and granulating or is it sloughy and yellow or is it necrotic? Have we got good blood flow to the wound? Um, is it inflamed or infected? Um, and how is it responding to treatment? What's it responded to? What hasn't it responded to? Then we're looking at the healthcare professional skill. How many wounds have they seen? If it's somebody that's newly graduated and it's a new patient that walks in, they might not have seen that many compared to somebody that's been in a wound healing clinic for, a, for years. It's people's experience levels have an impact um, as well. And then resource treatment implications. So there are factors of what equipment can people get hold of. Um, it might be that you're in a small outreach clinic and you can't get hold of topical negative wound care therapy or you haven't got speedy access to a clinic when you need them so it's what 
what factors are we, are we dealing with? So we need to think about all these things. And when you cover as much of them as you possibly can, then we've got the best chance of healing a, a wound. Not easy. Um, so um, what happens during a podiatry redressing appointment? So basically, I'll get a patient in and we'll go over, has their medication changed? How have they been feeling? Um, what's their footwear? What's their medication? All that patient, holistic. What's their general health? Um, and then we're looking at the dressings. So what's been on there? Has it struck through? Um, so we're looking at, you know, evaluating the dressing before you even take it off. Then we're looking at the wound bed. What's it looking like? Does it look worse than it did last time? So again, quality of note taking is essential. So if you've got poor documentation of the first person, you're not going to be able to see if it's deteriorated or not. We're looking for signs of infection, um, but taking into account that some of the patient's medical history might mask early signs of infection. So if you miss those medication links or poor blood supply links in the patient assessment, you might have a patient that is starting with a spreading infection but can't show the classic signs of inflammation. So you have to really look carefully at the patient history, medication, blood supply. So we, we check blood supply, we check nerve supply because a lot of patients with diabetes um, can't feel their feet anymore because of the process of diabetes. So they end up with feet that they can't feel and they can stand on something. Um, I've had patients that have had ulcers caused through a medicine cap that's been in the toe box of their shoe and they've not known about it. I've had nails through the bottom of shoes and they've walked around on it all day and not realised until they take their shoe off. And they can't, it's the severity of the lack of feeling that patients can have with neuropathy that they can get quite serious wounds without realising it. Um, so once we've assessed and we've we're happy, we've taken photos, we document it. Then we're looking at cleaning and debriding the area. So if it's safe to do so, they've got decent arterial flow, we will debride and get rid of any sort of sloughy wound bed, get rid of all that dead and devitalized tissue, get it back to granulating healthy um, skin. And then what we can do is um, dress it, redress it, protect it see if we need any footwear modifications, um, any insoles, and then review them. So depending on how it's going, most patients, if they're progressing in an orderly manner, um, we would see once a week. Depending on the severity, if they're starting to deteriorate or they're quite severe in the first instance, we might be seeing them twice, three times a week. So this is a big impact on patients that are struggling with mobility. Um, they find it difficult to come in or find family members that can bring them into clinics twice a week, three times a week. So sometimes we have to try and work out what's, what's best for the wound. You don't want to change it too much, but you don't want to leave it because leaving a dressing past its usefulness can make it deteriorate, um, which we definitely don't want to do. So this is just a sort of like a trajectory that we tend to get. So we've got quite a large heel wound. Um, which is sloughy, so you can see there's like a film on here by a film. So what we would do is we would debride this film off. So we've got this yellow sloughy film off, got it down to a red granulating base. So that's quite quick, we can do that. Get some offloading in the shoe. This is a week later, um, and then it shrinks gradually over time. So this is about four to six weeks later on. So with the right sort of treatment, debridement, um, treatment, we can move them on. So. As part of our wound assessment, we're looking for signs of infection. We're looking at what the wound edges are doing. We're measuring it, we're doing, taking photos. Offloading them, um, we might use swabs, um, capillary bed oxygen perfusion to see how much blood flow is getting there. Looking at where they are, size and sight and depth. And then looking at how much odour and exudate is there. So depending on, you know, each time they come in, you're doing all this sort of assessment of what, what the wounds are actually doing. Um, and it might be you just need to tweak your dressings a little bit. So if it's particularly malodorous one session, you would use something that has got ability to mask that odour so that the patient is more comfortable with it. Um, it might be it's particularly painful on dressing removal, so you'll use something that's lower tack that you can 
again, keep them as comfortable because um, if your patient's not with you, you you're not gonna you don't you don't get very far. Yeah. Um, so so clinical signs of deterioration. Um, what you can see is that you will get sort of macerated, soggy <coughs> wound edges. So this was a wound that had a dressing on that wasn't, it didn't have his enough absorption to deal with the exudate that was coming off it. So it had a low absorption capacity dressing, needed a medium one, because um, otherwise it's those proteases are sitting on the skin next door, basically making it macerated and soggy, leading to tissue destruction of healthy tissue, and then the wound gets larger. Um, so that's that increased size. Excoriation is sort of this red sort of burning type. Um, it's, it's where the proteases in the exudate sit on the good skin around and about and create quite a large inflammatory reaction in the locality. So you get this red, raw, damaged, really painful skin. And again, it's early signs that if we, if we don't change the dressing, this is all going to start ulcerating as well. And then you end up with a much larger wound. So we get this erythema, so we get redness. Um, this one was a rheumatoid wound, and we've got a lot of erythema coming up here because we were starting to get um, sort of infection tracking because it was right over the sort of talus and navicular on the midfoot, and the foot was in quite extreme collapse, pr pronation. So we were getting a lot of footwear friction on the side of that. So until you reposition the foot and get footwear friction and then control the infection in there, it's not going to go in the right direction. Um, so you tend to find devitalised tissue tends to have a spongy texture, so you tend to notice you lose normal firm skins and it really goes quite boggy and spongy because there's a lot of tissue fluid in the area. That inflammation has increased and you, again it just starts breaking down. If the patient is lucky enough to feel pain, it becomes more painful. I say lucky enough because if it hurts, you avoid it. If it doesn't hurt, you keep walking on it, you keep damaging it, and it becomes worse through impact and trauma. So patients with neuropathy will keep walking around on things that you or I wouldn't even dream of because it would hurt to put a shoe on, let alone walk around the supermarket. Um, and what you may see is deterioration in the wound bed itself. So it might go from granulation to slough down to necrosis. So they, they're all clues that what the wound is doing. So we need to address all those, really. So we need to create and maintain a wound... Uh, a woost, that's a good word, <laughs> a moist wound environment, um, because if we've got anything that's too dry, we can't get those growth factors across the wound bed. We can't get the new cells that are trying to fill the hole where they should be. Um, if it's too dry, it basically just dries out and nothing happens. Um, so basically we need to create a moist environment but not too wet. We need to make sure any microbes that are in there are at an optimal level for the host. It's unlikely that we'll eradicate all of them but we've got to keep them at as low as we can. And again, just monitor these proteases to make sure they're not getting too high. And then dealing with all those three will allow us to create an optimal wound environment, which will allow us to go on towards healing. So there's that wound I showed you before. It was all quite soggy. Um, we literally changed the dressing to something a bit more, with a bit more absorption holding capacity and offloaded it because it was on the ball of the big toe underneath the, so the big toe's up here. So this is on the ball of the foot just underneath the big toe. So it's a prime loading area for as you're walking. Um, so literally we changed the dressings sort of three weeks later with a better dressing and better offloading. You can make quite a drastic difference really quickly in some instances. And then this one will be stepping back down now to a low absorption dressing, still offloading it because it's more likely to ulcerate because it's on a weight bearing area, but we can then get an insole into the shoe, a dressing that's quick and easy to replace, and then get them healed a few more weeks later. Um, so, so just to recap, so effective wound management, you need to 
treat all those underlying factors or as many of them as possible um, and then optimize the wound environment um, and by doing that you enhance the patient's quality of life and the patient's experience of having a wound. So wound infection is a massive problem. Um, we've got as I said, of every hundred to hospitalise patient at seven, de seven in developing and ten in developing countries will acquire at least one healthcare acquired infection. So these are wounds that people have either got and they acquire an infection after they've had the injury or they've had a surgical procedure which then becomes infected at a later date um, and it is estimated that financial losses due to these healthcare acquired infections are estimated to be about seven billion so if you add that onto the chronicity of wounds as well okay um, so Average time from operation to infection detection is 10.9 days in some instances. There's only some surgical procedures which have to report their infection rates. So I think it's coronary artery bypass grafts, knee operations, hip operations. So and there's, there's two more. Um, but they're the, only, they're the only procedures that are required to report their surgical site infections post-op. So there's an awful lot of procedures that are still performed that we have no information about how quick their infection rates are thereafter. So if we have a means to identify infection earlier and infection is associated with increased chronicity of wounds and increased hospital stays and increased costs, as well as deteriorating patient quality of life, the faster we can pick up early infections, the better win, win, win everywhere. Yeah. Um, so we typically get bacteria in a wound, it becomes colonised and most wounds will sit around here in a healthy individual. It's as they start spreading that we end up with problems where here it's IV antibiotic requirement, here it might be oral antibiotics and topical antimicrobials um, in these two and a wound, a chronic wound will migrate up and down here. So you're assessing that as a clinician. Where is this wound? Is it still sitting down here? Do I need a topical antimicrobial yet? Yay or nay? So addressing that could tell, or something that could tell you, actually the colony is starting to increase. Let's start an antimicrobial a bit sooner than waiting for the signs and symptoms that we're relying on as clinicians would just be really helpful. So there's grading systems out there to help classify Infections, there's different ones which, depending on which clinic you work in, depends on which one they use, which doesn't help at times. So there's Infection Diseases Society of America, which have got classifications of if a wound is infected or not. Um, the one that tends most moderate infected is sort of cellulitis or redness spreading two centimetres from a wound. Um, is where you would really you know, start treating quite heavily with antibiotics, um, sometimes IV, depending. But again, it might be that those, that inflammation's masked if somebody's on um, methotrexate or some of the rheumatoid arthritis medication, that'll mask that. Um, so again, some nasty foot wounds that this is actually spreading. There's an abscess going under the skin here. We've actually got cellulitis coming up the foot, so that would be a straight to hospital, as would this one. So this is severe tissue loss, very sloughy, you know, straight to hospital, and they're likely to be in there for um, a month, if not more, and likely to need quite extensive surgery to, to rectify that. So we need to prioritise whether or not there's lack of blood flow to the leg, because unless we address that lack of blood flow, um, we're not going to get a wound to healing. So that's priority. We need to ascertain that. We need to find out if we've got a dominant infection, because until you get that dominant infection under control, you're going to get tissue loss and you might have an impact on the amount of blood flow to the area. And then if we've got extensive devitalised tissue, tissue damage, we need to remove that in order to allow the other two to heal. So we need to think about all these factors. So I've said that, so I'm skipping that one. Um, so again, we just need to pick dressings appropriately and 
continue with patient engagement and education and try and do what we can to keep people as motivated and positive as possible in these difficult times. Um, so effective use of dressings and devices to manage the wound bed and jumpstart wound healing are essential um, to ensure optimal care. There's definite scope for improving dressings um, to help us pick up these infections sooner to help us pick up clues as to the micro environment of a wound bed there's a lot going on and there's an awful lot of clinicians out there that might not necessarily see wounds as often as the clinical specialists in wound healing centers that need those clues in order to help make sure they pick the right treatment process for a patient um, and then what we can do is, if we pick dressings appropriately, we can control infection, we can control that exudate and odour, we can improve the quality of the life of the patient, we can optimise treatment costs, we can minimise the amount of staff appointments and appointment times and hospital admissions, because the faster you're dealing and picking up these infections, you will stop these severe infections and people going into hospital. So it is a win-win-win all round. So there are a lot of advances in wound care. Um, there's, um, you know, elements of there's there's growth factors being introduced. There's scaffolds with stem cells. There's epidermal harvesting that you can spray onto wounds. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts going on. It's a big market. I think it's something like 15.5 billion dollars was estimated that the dressing market is in 2010. Um, so there's, there's still scope for dressing advances. Um, so from a clinician's perspective, it's a nightmare having to use two or three different dressings because you need an element of that dressing and you need the absorption of that one and you need the antimicrobial property of that one. You want a dressing that is just a one-stop shop that does everything because the more layers you put in, you've got shear, you've got friction and you've got more potential tissue damage. So we're trying to create, we want dressings that, you know, can do what we need at the time and be really smart. We need them to be really clever. So um, <coughs> with, those, with those smart technologies, we'll end up with infection detected earlier, patient's quality of life will improve, clinician's time will be used to better effect or we'll see more patients and ultimately we'll end up with reduced cost and that's it okay. <coughs>